welcome to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors, endless stories. Friends in Fiction is a Facebook Live program with five best-selling novelists whose common love of reading, writing, and independent bookstores bound them together with chats, author interviews, and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Best-selling novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. At the start of the pandemic, they got together for a virtual happy hour to talk about their books, their favorite bookstores, writing, reading, and publishing in this new uncharted territory. They're still talking, and they've added fascinating discussions with other best-selling novelists. So join them live on their Friends and Fiction Facebook group page every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern, or listen and view later at your leisure on their podcast or on their website at www.friendsandfiction.com. Good evening, and welcome to Friends and Fiction. Tonight, we are all praying for peace and hope across our great nation. Friends and Fiction is a place of refuge for us, and we hope it is for you, too. I'm Mary Alice Monroe, and I'm delighted to be your host tonight. My upcoming novel is The Summer of Lost and Found, coming out May 11th. And I'm Mary Kay Andrews, and my forthcoming novel is The Newcomers, out May 4th. I'm Kristen Harmel, and my next novel is The Forest of Vanishing Stars, out July 6th. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey, and my next book is Under the Southern Sky, releasing April 20th. And last but not least, I am Patty <laughs> Callahan Henry, and my next novel is Surviving Savannah in exactly eight weeks. Oh, yay! So exciting. Yay. Very exciting. Well, we've been looking forward to tonight to welcome the award winning author, William Kent Kruger. But first, a few announcements. Let's begin by announcing our highlighted independent bookstore. We have a few, the bookstore coming up with, it is called The Once Upon a Crime, and it is located in Minnesota. And many of you may not know that William Kent Kruger is also the author of an award-winning mystery series, The Cork O'Connor Mysteries. That's also set in Minnesota. So it's no surprise that his choice of bookstores would be a bookstore that focuses on mystery novels. Once Upon a Crime primarily stocks mystery fiction. And if you love mystery, they'll work with you to find that book you're searching for. But if you want to order a non-mystery, they can order that too and ship directly to you. And tonight, Once Upon a Crime is offering 10% off of William Kent Kruger's books, including Ordinary Grace and This Tender Land, as well as the recent and upcoming novels of the Fab Five, the five of us authors here. And as a bonus, Kent lives near the store. So if you'd like a signed copy, let them know that when you order. The link is on our Facebook page under announcements. And our presenting sponsor tonight for our show is Mama Geraldine's um, Traditional Southern Snacking. They're offering 20% off of orders with the code FAB5. Um, and that is a deal you are not going to want to miss out on. I did want to mention, um, I know a couple of you had some problems with the shipping price last week. That has been all fixed. Um, and I think if you paid extra shipping, they have refunded you also. But if you went last week and you thought, oh my goodness, the shipping's really high, go back because you're going to want to have these treats. Uh, my personal favorite is the pecan cinnamonies, but the cheese straws are also to die for. Thank you. And now to the person we are all eager to meet. William Kent Kruger is the celebrated award-winning author of the New York Times bestseller, Ordinary Grace, and his latest best-selling novel, This Tender Land. He's also the author of the long-running Cork O'Connor mystery series, for which he's won multiple awards, including back-to-back -back Anthony Awards, the coveted Edgar Award for Mystery Writers of America, and the Good Reads Choice Award for Mystery and Thriller. I love this author's bio, and I took it right from his website. <laughs> William Kett Kruger briefly attended Stanford University before being kicked out for radical activities. 
After that, he logged timber. Don't you love that? I just love him for that alone. After that, he logged timber. He worked construction. He tried his hand at freelance journalism and eventually ended up researching child development at the University of Minnesota. He currently makes his living as a full-time author. He's been married for over 40 years to a wonderful, marvelous woman who was a retired art attorney. He makes his home in St. Paul, a city he dearly loves. He may claim he doesn't have a degree, yet his novels reflect his scholarship in the classics. Several great novels and motifs are mentioned when discussing this Wonderland. Virgil's The Odyssey with the story's epic journey, Charles Dickens and the inequality and abuse of boys in school. John Steinbeck brings to mind the desperate poverty of the Depression era. Mark Twain with Huckleberry Finn and the Vagabonds adventure down the Mississippi River. Sinclair Lewis's Elmer Gantry with religious revival. And finally, L. Frank Baum's The Wizard of Oz. And that's pretty heady company. And it explains why this tender land has the feel of a classic. It was, and I'm honest about this, it was my favorite book. So it's for me a really great pleasure to introduce William Kent Kruger. Hello. 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 Thank you so much for having me. Thanks we are so oh. happy you're here. Thank you. We are really, truly, we love your book. And I'm sure if everyone out there who hasn't read it yet, is there anyone out there who hasn't, you will too. <laughs> well, in the past few weeks, most of us here have finished and handed into our publishers, publishers a new novel. And finishing a novel is followed by all of us with this great sigh of relief. <laughs> So what I'm asking all of you, including you, Kent, can you share what you do after you push send? And is it harder for you to send in the unedited draft to your editor, knowing edits are coming, or in the final past pages, knowing you won't be able to work on it any longer? <laughs> so, Kent, I know that you confess. <laughs> I don't know about uh, all of you, but for me, it's a never ending process. <laughs> ah, <laughs> Until I actually have that finished product in my hand, uh, you know, everything is up for grabs. Um, so when I have finished the first draft of the novel, typically I'll try to set it aside for a while so that I can come back to it a bit later with a fresher eye. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll send uh, the manuscript off to my agent for her comments goes through revisions, then I send it to my editor for his comments, it goes through revisions, then I send, then I get the copy edited uh, manuscript back, address all of those, and then finally those final, the, the first pass pages and second pass pages come. I have to be honest with you, by the time I get the second pass pages, I'm pretty tired of it all. <laughs> yes, I know the feeling. We know, yeah. we know, <laughs> we hear you. But yeah. you know, uh, as soon as I have finished all of that process, I have to move on to the next project. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you. I feel so at sea if I'm not actually at work yes. on a project. Well, that's interesting. That really is. But you don't give yourself an award like today I'm going to buy myself a new ball cap or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I have a whole collection of ball caps that have I've nothing to do with my writing. <laughs> it, it, it's all because underneath there, there is this really... A shiny uh, a bald pate that monkeys with the camera light. So I always wear, I always wear a bald pate. Well, you look adorable in it. So. But, but I usually celebrate by going out and buying a few donuts and chocolate milk, actually. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. Like that. that's there it is. Well, I, just, I love that you're rocking the Ron Howard look. Oh, yes. Yes. Really awesome. The Steven Spielberg look. Yeah. Yes. That's yeah, very sexy. We like that. Uh, anybody yeah. else want to confess what they do at, when they push send or which they prefer? Well, I celebrate sending it in the first, finishing it and sending the first draft off. I don't do multiple drafts. I finish the book, then I send it to my agent and my editor simultaneously. And I always celebrate with the same thing, which is uh, Reese cups, okay. and when I can and when I can get my hands on it, wink grapefruit soda. 
<laughs> well, I don't distribute Wink in Georgia, where I live. Oh. They did when I lived in North Carolina. Um, but yeah, Re Reese Cups is how I celebrate. And then I, I'm like you, Ken. I go right. It's time, you know. Yeah. Plus, yeah. I think all of us are. We're on a fast track. We're all on a. I think we're all on a book a year schedule. So there's there it, there's really no time to go out and buy ball caps. I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> That's funny. Ooh, I, donuts, yes. I need a new I need a new celebration ritual. I, I, I clean I my office. I, I like yeah. the wink way better. Um, <laughs> usually by the time those last first pass pages are sent in, my office looks like a bomb went off in it because yes. I've ignored everything. So there's this great flurry of, of I'm gonna clean it up. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, and then immediately, because usually I think all of y'all too, there's been something brewing right? Absolutely. It's been on that back burner yeah. and you've been thinking. Yeah. So as soon as they're handed in and it's never the end when you hand them in, but you know, you, you want to jump in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I feel like by the time those uh, the first pass or the final pass pages come to you, months have elapsed from the time you've turned in yeah. you know, your first draft and then your edit, like time has passed. And if you weren't writing in the meantime, you've now wasted a few months on your next book sort of, or at least on the next idea. So mm -hmm. honestly, by the time I'm doing final pass pages, I feel like, oh no, this is kind of taking me away from the work at hand. Mm -hmm. Like the work I'm really yeah. feeling passionate about now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I feel that exact same way. And I have this thing where before I have a book handed in, I have to be at least like 10,000 words into my next manuscript or I start getting kind of panicky because I'm like, I'll never have another idea. There'll never be another <laughs> yeah. book. Like, so I have to kind of take a step back and work for a little bit. Yeah. But I think for me, it's much more nerve wracking to send in that first draft than it is to send the final one. Cause by the final one, I feel like I've gotten enough people's opinions that like, it's probably yeah. not just terrible, you know, like that many people <laughs> cannot have read it and it'd be just terrible. So I think it's, but they, they, they both come with their own sense of sort of challenges. You know, yeah. Christy, it's the opposite for me. Like after I've hit send on those final pass pages, I will literally be woken up in the middle of the night by nightmares that I've missed like one word that I translated yep. incorrectly or one detail wrong that's going to ruin the entire book and now it's too late to fix it. I, I the can't. One acknowledgement. Oh. No, it's always yeah, the one, one acknowledgement. acknowledgement. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. I had oh, that this week. Oh, I, I have, have to write cold. mine this week. I'm so panicked. <laughs> no, and I'll wake up with the cold sweat that like everyone's going to hate it and it's yeah. awful. And I mean, I definitely have all of that, but I think the the knowing that there's something about knowing that it's just out of your hands to me, yes. that's different than knowing all the work that's about to come. I get but that. You know, yep. What follows when you turn it in and it's being prepared for production is, and I don't know about you, is the worry about, okay, so what are people going to think of this? What are the yeah. critics yeah. going to say of this? And totally. you know, I, I have a, a, I have to admit, I'm impressed 80 books between you. Uh, I've been you in all 20, 22, 24 book Kent? You've got a I lot. Have, uh, I, have tw I only have 20. I feel like a slacker. slacker. Well, <laughs> Ken, yeah, we wouldn't have invited you no if way, you, know, you only had 20. <laughs> <laughs> You're out. A mistake's been made. Is, 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 is there a way to cut this show a tad short? Or... <laughs> oh, well, let's talk about the book, though. That, uh, it's number 20. What is it? Tenderland is 20, is it number 20? Oh, 21? I think 20, I think it's 20 even. Wow. Well, or maybe it's 21. I'm not I sure. <laughs> Lucky number anyway, 21. Well, I both read this Tenderland and I listened to the audio book. In fact, here on Friends in Fiction, I raved about the audio. I think it was a really great narration. So will you please give our viewers a brief summary of this epic tale, This Tenderland? Sure, the Stenderland is set in the summer of 1932 during the Great Depression. It's the story of four orphans in the law committed um, a terrible crime, but for the right reason. They know if they take to the roads to get away, they're going to be caught rather quickly because a huge manhunt has been launched to capture them. They're afraid to ride the rails, as everybody was doing back in the Depression, because the railroads back then were patrolled by private cops called bulls. And the bulls had a reputation for being incredibly cruel. 
So, uh, so the kids decide instead to, um, to take to the rivers. They canoe a river called the Gilead to the Minnesota. They canoe the Minnesota River to the Mississippi. And their plan is to canoe all the way down the Mississippi River to St. Louis, where they believe they have family and they'll be safe. I've always wanted to write an updated version of Huckleberry Finn. This is my yeah. Huckleberry yeah. Finn. You did it for sure. I see that. I see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think, I hope you all can hear. Um, this is the part of the show where we get to ask you questions. And I've listened to a lot of the interviews and you always have such great answers. So I'll start. Can y'all hear? I know yeah, that's an issue in my mind. Great. So Kent, what a bunch of vagabonds you created with this group. <laughs> you have Odysseus or Odie, the clever cunning boy. Then his brother, Albert, who's the mechanical whiz and kind of the boy in charge responsible. And I love Mose, the native Indian who's voiceless without a name or family, unable to speak. And little Emmy, who everyone loves, and she is a seer. So I, I'm big Dickens fans, as everyone knows, and this is like the children in Dickens books, these children endured a really harsh, unspeakable cruelty in this Lincoln Indian training school. And during their journey all along the Gilead, they were treated harshly. There were quite scary moments. So I'd like to have you discuss how the children shared this trauma that united them and how they also had this shared vision or idea of home and how close to the odyssey did you really stick as you wrote this <laughs> um several questions in there um let's take the odyssey question first the odyssey was where my thinking began um, um, this is a story i've tried to write a couple of times across my uh, my career as a writer and um and i was never able to sink my teeth into the story. I have to tell you honestly, this is a story I've wanted to write since I was 11 years old. Wow. When I was 11, uh, that would have been in the fifth grade, um, our teacher read to the class The Adventures of uh, Tom Sawyer. She did it by yeah. reading half an hour after lunch every day. I love that book. Here was this kid and he was just like me and he was out there on the Mississippi River having these really great adventures. And of course, after that, I had to read Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which I loved even more. Um, and so, Ever since then, really, I've wanted to write a story that would pay homage to Mark Twain. That might be, as I said, in a way, an updated version of Huckleberry Finn. Uh, but I, when I tried to write it, I couldn't sink my teeth into it because I didn't know the structure. Uh, my father was a high school English teacher. And uh, when I was quite young, instead of reading, uh, you know, um, the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, he had me reading the Iliad and the Odyssey. Never cared much for the <laughs> Iliad, but I love the Odyssey. And so the idea came to me. Um, why not use the structure that Homer used in the, in the Odyssey? And, and then I began to envision a story in sections in which each section would be an adventure that these vagabonds would have that would mirror an experience that Odysseus had in his long journey from Troy back to Ithaca. And that's really when the story began to, to come together. Um, let's see, what else did you ask me? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Sorry, I have to unmute myself about the shared trauma, and I really think trauma. Yeah. You studied early at children education, and I'm yeah. thinking there must be something about trauma. One of the things, right? Thank you for asking, because nobody has ever asked me this before. But one of the things that I studied, uh, the lab in which I worked, studied it at the University of Minnesota in the Institute of Child Development, was resilience in children, and what we oh. found was that children are that. incredibly resilient yeah. given the proper mm -hmm. support. And so what happens across the course of the summer for these four vagabonds is they create family and the family becomes their support and they love one another and care about one another. And that's what sustains them and gives them the resilience that allows them to deal with all of the harsh uh, circumstances that come their way. Oh, I love that answer. It really yeah. makes it, it really rings true for me. Thank you. Kent, one of my favorite characters in this tender land was Mose, the mute Indian. And he represented the Native American, the voiceless. Could you tell us more about the real effort of cultural genocide in the United States, the real effect of cultural genocide in the US, including the off-reservation boarding schools 
for Native Americans that inspired the London, the Lincoln School. I think that for me was, you know, as Mary Alice said, a really Dickensian institution. Yeah, very much so. Um, I won't go way back because a lot of this history, everybody knows. Um, we really, as, uh, as a nation of European immigrants, did our best to eradicate all of the indigenous people who were here. As we moved farther and farther west, we pushed them farther and farther west. And if uh, if we didn't push them, um, we did our best to kill them. Really, that's the truth. Um, and uh, and when all of that didn't work, and in, in in the end, what they did was because they they couldn't they couldn't do it any other way. In the end, they came for the children, and that's what the Native mm. American boarding school system was all about. Was Although, um, so the, the, the Native American boarding school system began in the late 1880s. Uh, it was the brainchild of a guy named uh, Colonel Henry Richard Pratt or Richard Henry Pratt. Um, and he convinced the federal government to allow him to open a boarding school for Native American uh, boys in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And the government uh, considered it such a successful endeavor that they began opening up other boarding schools across the country following the, uh, the um, format that Pratt adopted. Pratt's Pratt's idea was this, kill the Indian, save the man. His belief, you know, I have to believe wow. that he really thought it was a sincere effort to help the Native people. His belief was is that the only hope for the Native people was to fully in, incorporate them into white culture. And that's what the Native American boarding schools were meant to do. In truth, what they turned out being, they were supposed to train Native children to become productive members of our society. In, ter in, in truth, what they turned out to be was free labor for local uh, farmers and, uh, and other people. Um, the yeah. education was poor, the nutrition was poor, the conditions were horrible, um, and the punishments for speaking their language or practicing their religion um, were horrific. Um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah. Yeah, and, and that lasted for almost 100 years, the boarding school system, for 100 years. You were a Native American parent, and the government came and said, we're taking your children away, and we're going to cart them off to a native uh, to a boarding school hundreds of miles away, and you won't see them for a while, or maybe never. There was nothing you could say. Uh, you had no, no recourse. The law, until 1978, when the National Indian Child Welfare Act was passed, that was the law. That is just the idea of being powerless is the powerlessness of these kids. I think is a is a recurring is a recurring thread through mm -hmm. through this narrative. And 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 I love the fact that it's only when they leave that school that they find their own power. Yeah, you know, and Odie is always Odie's always pushing back. Yeah, Odie. <laughs> yeah. Odysseus. <laughs> but Odie never gives up. He's he uh, he really has it in for the Black Witch. Yeah, the Black Witch was really great. I mean, that's what kids would have seen her as a witch. Um, mm -hmm. And you kept the kids. That's one of the things I love too. Was you kept the mindset of the kids in the for they weren't adults in kids' bodies. They were kids, and they had the kids' fears, which I really loved. And I was right along with them on the journey. Good. Oh, good. I think that the when I first was reading about the Lincoln School, I was hoping you had made that up about our history. Mm -hmm. And I went and looked it up and realized that you hadn't. So another one of the themes that runs through the book um, are rivers. rivers. The river is a really deep metaphor in this novel. I have poems about them and photos of them all over my office. I'm obsessed with rivers and yeah. this line in your book speaks so much to me. You say, there is a river that runs through time and the universe, vast and inexplicable, a flow of spirit that is the heart of all existence. So I wanna know about your history with rivers and why you chose this river and if you knew it would be a metaphor for the whole story. Oh, don't we all as as writers love rivers because they're metaphors yeah. 
so many things. Uh, and in this Tenderland, uh, certainly it's a metaphor for the, the children's journey uh, to the discovery of what's important to each of them uh, and finding that. It's a metaphor for um, the journey in creating family. It's a metaphor for the spiritual journey that certainly Odie is on. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up on rivers and rivers have always just held this mysterious appeal for me. That's what I was wondering, yeah. yeah so if you read uh, the companion novel to this Tenderland is a novel called Ordinary Grey. The river plays a significant role in that as well. Um, I, I may never write a, a, a significant novel going forward without putting a big river at the heart. Yeah. Of oh, Patty's going to love that. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me there's a river in it. Put a river in the title. And I'm like, hi. But also, <laughs> Ken, you like to, uh, you actually went on the river in your canoe, you said. Yeah. You know, I don't know about all of you, but. I try never to write about a place or an experience uh, I haven't had myself, with the exception of the murders in the Cork O'Connor series. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. I, yeah. I, I, you know, when I, I knew I was going to have these kids on the rivers, uh, I'm a canoeist, and that, that's one of the things I love about Minnesota. Great, great area for canoeing. Um, but I canoe primarily lakes, uh, but I wanted to get out there on the river so I could feel what the kids were feeling. I wanted to mm. know what and what they smelled and uh, what made them afraid, all of those things. So yeah, I got on a kayak and I kayaked the, the Minnesota River. And then my wife and I together canoed that section of the Mississippi that the kids canoe in the story. Oh, and wow. That's a section. You can through tell. And, uh, and St. Paul is a very busy, the Mississippi River is very busy in St. Paul. It's heavy barge traffic. And in the wake of all of these big barges, there are these huge, you know, waves, these huge wakes. So two or three times while my wife and I were canoeing, I was sure we were going to get swamped. Oh, <laughs> but it's I didn't know that. the mistake of the book. Spoiler, he did not drown. <laughs> <laughs> Unless this is the ghost of William Kent Kruger with us uh, here. Yes. You know, you can always tell when a writer really was um, in, the, in the water or on the land. You can always tell, and it was so vivid. Well done. Well, thank yeah. you. You know, I spent a lot of time in Southern Minnesota. Um, one, because I love the area, and two, just to soak up all of the details that would make it come to life. So there's a scene in uh, the story in which Cody O'Banion shares a kiss with Maybeth Schofield, the girl who falls in love with, uh, on a rock on a hillside. I sat on that rock. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I loved that part. Oh, it was so sweet. <laughs> thank you for so, sharing that. <laughs> yeah. So, Kent, you mentioned just a moment ago the series of mystery novels you wrote before you decided to write your first, or was it your first standalone novel, um, Ordinary Grace? Was that your first standalone, or had you, you written know, others I, before that? My fourth published novel was what in the business we call a standalone thriller. It was a political Oh, okay. Movie. Uh, nothing like Ordinary Grace of this Tenderland. Yeah, so very different. What, what made you switch genres? What brought you from the decision to shift from a very successful award-winning mystery series to writing a literary masterpiece, basically? How, how did your publisher respond? And um, it, it, what was sort of the reaction internally and, and what was the thought process? When I proposed the idea of the Ordinary Grace to my publisher, they didn't want it. <laughs> they called me out to New York City in kind of a panic and sent me down and said, Kent, we really want Cork O'Connor novels from you. <laughs> so I knew it was going to be a risky proposition. I wrote that manuscript uh, not under contract because oh, it sort of spoke to me in such a compelling way that I knew I had to, I had to write it. Uh, so across the course of the next three years, every minute that wasn't devoted to a contractual obligation in my Cork O'Connor series, I spent composing the manuscript for ordinary days. Now, they, even though they didn't want it, I went ahead and sent it to my editor, Tammany Schuster, when it was finished. He loved it. Uh, oh, she good. published it, they did. Northern Grace has just had this really remarkable reception from critics and readers alike. It, uh, it won tons of awards when it came out. It's been translated into more than two dozen foreign languages. Um, so far, it sold uh, nearly a million copies. So, what it did was open the door for me wow. to do other things besides this news. Good for you. Yeah. That's remarkable to have kind of followed your heart into the kind of book you want to write. That's uh, it, it's, yeah. it's an incredible way to kind of guide the ship of your own career. And Ken, can you just tell briefly also that was the success of Ordinary Grace and then you're going to write a follow up to it? 
Yeah. That's a good story. Can you share that with us? Sure. So when my publisher saw how well Ordinary Grace was doing, boy, did they want another book just like <laughs> it. <laughs> Of you tell us what not to do until we do it right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's so true. So I signed a contract for a companion novel. They paid me a shitload of money. And, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and I spent the next two years writing what I thought would be the companion novel. That, that manuscript was contractually due to my publisher five years ago. Two months before that contractual deadline, I set up a meeting in Chicago to talk to my agent about revisions for the piece because there were problems with it. I knew it was new. Two days before we got together, I sent her a note saying, when we meet, I don't want to talk about how we revise this piece. I want to talk about how we keep it from being public. Because it wasn't the story I thought it would be. I didn't know how to make it that story. Wow. Wow. Isn't that but amazing? I tell you, my, my publisher turned out to be really understanding. They said, fine, you don't have to give us this manuscript, but you still owe us a companion novel. So here's the wow. deal. Here's what was going on. And maybe you've experienced this too. The expectations for that follow-up novel were enormous. Yes. And, and the whole time I was trying to write the story, I just felt crushed by the weight of all those expectations. And really what I was doing when I was writing it was trying to meet everybody else's expectations yes. instead of writing the story that spoke to me from my heart. But as soon as all that weight got lifted off my shoulders and I felt free again, I saw so clearly the story I should have been writing, that story that spoke to me since I was 11 years old. Wow. That's what I wanted you to tell. I love that story. It's so, so inspirational. It's so clearly to all all authors, I think. You know, I and it's the it's a story I like telling uh, younger writers um, because you know there's so many voices out there telling you what you ought to be writing, what's going to sell, what's hot, all of that stuff. Yes. And I tell younger writers the only voice you should be listening to is the one that speaks to you from your heart. Yeah. Well, and that's a really perfect segue into my question, Kent. So thank you for that. <laughs> but spiritualism is such another really important player in this novel. The nature of God, as well as the character's relationship with God, has big consequences. For example, Odie's tornado god, Sister Eve's forgiving god. And then there were the seers, which was one of the most fascinating parts of this book to me. Sister Eve could touch a hand and know the person's history and their greatest fear. Young Emmy Spitz could deliver her a vision of the future and possibly a means to alter the future. Can you discuss the roles of God and seers on this epic journey? And you also revealed that your own mother was a seer. Can you tell us about her? Sure. Um, you know, I have a, when I created Emmy as a seer, I knew there were going to be certain readers who would go, oh, give me a break. Um, because uh, they didn't grow up the way I grew up. Uh, yeah, I grew up in a house where my mom, my mother was a seer. It was not uncommon when I was a kid for uh, the telephone to ring and she would say, um, there's trouble with Aunt Joanne. And sure enough, wow. there was trouble with Joanne. Wow. Uh, she would toss and turn in bed for several nights and she would say something's going to happen and it's not going to be good. And something would happen and it wasn't good. So, um, so it wasn't difficult for me. I have to tell you a little bit about Emmy. Emmy came late to my thinking as a vagabond. I had initially created her simply to be a daughter for Cora Frost because I thought Cora Frost was a woman who would have a daughter like Emmy. But the more I wrote, uh, the more I wrote scenes with her in it, the more I fell in love with her. And when it came time for the vagabonds to uh, to leave the uh, the school, I thought, oh, crap, they're going to leave her in the world. <laughs> you can't do that. So uh, I had to give her a part to play. And uh, and I decided I was going to make her a seer. Um, again, part of the reason for that was is that when I was uh, when I was a kid, among the many things that my father had me read were all the, the epic journeys, heroes and heroines. And so uh, one of the things I remembered is that on many of the journeys that a hero or heroine takes, he or she is accompanied by a seer. Somebody can look into the future and offer advice, whether it's taken or not. Yeah. So uh, I made Emmy my seer. I, love I just thought that was absolutely incredible. And I think it's really hard to do that in a novel because it's like you said, you know, people, in order to make that believable, you know, when you see it in real life and you experience it in real life, it sort of takes your breath away. But to be able to put that on a page can be yeah. really, really difficult. Yeah. yeah. And you I did such a great story, job. Too. If, if I have just a moment, let me tell you this yeah, story. Yeah, please. Yeah. please. When, when, um, when uh, This Tenderland came out, I did a reading in a bookstore. I won't tell you what the bookstore was or where it was. But the bookseller at the end, when everybody had cleared out, she called me over. Uh, into an isolated aisle, just just uh, her and me. And she said, I have to tell you, I absolutely believed Emmy 
because I have seen visions all my life. Oh, um, wow. it, it has been a difficult thing for me all my life. Um, wow. And then she shared some of the difficulties with me and I'm thinking, boy, to be a seer is not necessarily uh, a, yeah. good thing. a good thing. Yeah, it's a big yeah. responsibility, I'm sure. And it's yeah. also a responsibility to hear that story as well. You know, that, that was a confidence. Yeah, a blessing. That's right, Mary Kay. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, for ladies, for asking your questions. And now we ha get to get questions from our viewers. And we pulled a few questions from our Facebook page, from our members. And if you're watching now, please leave a few questions in the live feed. So, Kristen, why don't you begin asking a question from them? Yeah, uh, Kent, Ann Parks Lynn would like to know, are the Cork O'Connor mysteries based on real events or true stories? Um, many of them are based on true situations. Um, oh, wow. They've used um, important elements of our culture here in Minnesota to create this story. So I have written about Native American, uh, and, you know, and the effect that that's had both on um, the Ojibwe population and the surrounding white population. I've written about the ongoing battle we have here in Minnesota over hunting and fishing treaty rights. I've written about the really tragic situation that exists here in the Twin Cities and in many large cities with a significant native population that involves the sexual trafficking of vulnerable oh, native uh, yeah. uh, women and children. So I often use a real situation and create a story around that so that I can present this issue uh, to a readership that uh, may or may not be aware of it, but, but try to inform them in a way that at least gets them thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. Patty. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm sitting here nodding like, yeah, yeah tell me more about the Fork series. I just, I just think it's fascinating that you can write these mystery series and dive into these kind of events yeah. of, of death and, and mystery and then write this tender odyssey yeah. down a river. And I'm like, where's your twin brother? What's going on? <laughs> but, um, that is not the question. The question Can I is jump on that for a second, Patty? Because actually you brought up a really good point. When you're writing, you, are I'm you right, always? <laughs> always. <laughs> when you are on, are you a book a year for your mysteries or do you, uh, what is, do you have to put your epic novel in between that or yeah. you stop for you do yeah um i like most uh uh well it sounds i would say most writers in my genre the mystery genre but it sounds like in your area too a book a year is commercial speed that's what your yeah. publisher expects yeah. you uh to deliver so uh, both ordinary grace and this tender land were written between contractual obligations now i have signed a contract for a third companion novel wow. and um, and Good I, news. Thank you. I'd ask <laughs> to be built into the uh, contract a deadline that would allow me a full two years to do nothing but focus on that particular work. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't well, want that to happen. It would be difficult to be away from Cork O'Connor for that long, but I'm willing to, yeah. to make that sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. I'm sorry for interrupting you, Patty. Now you could ask your question. No, no, that's fine. Plus, I like the name Cork O'Connor. Um, I do so. Great. Don't read my books; it might show up. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm only talking to you, Kent. Everybody else read them, but Kent, in case Cork shows up in a name. Um, Kristen Voiceney, I am sorry for butchering that middle name. Kieran asks. Can you please tell us where you got the character of the pig scarer? I'm wondering the same thing, actually. Sure. If you remember your Odyssey, one of the adventures that Odysseus and his men have is an encounter with a cyclops, Polyphemus. Yeah. Um, and uh, so Polyphemus, uh, One-Eyed Jack is my Polyphemus. And if you remember ah. your if you remember. Okay. Let's see how does uh, how does uh, Odysseus escape? He gets Polyphemus drunk. How does Odi escape? You know, um, they feed uh, one eye Jack the the corn liquor. You know. So on that note, who who are the sirens? The sirens aren't really in there. I had initially okay. believed the sirens were going to be part of the, that section that takes place on uh, in Hopersville. Yes. Uh, yeah, that was my guess. And there would be okay. a number of people that Odie would, uh, the, the music would come into it. 
Instead, I decided to focus in that section on, uh, if you remember your Odyssey, uh, at one point on his journey, Odysseus meets a sorceress named uh, Calypso. And he falls in love with Calypso, and Calypso falls in love with him. And Calypso nearly seduces uh, Odysseus away from his journey home, as Maybeth Schofield nearly does. Maybeth. Yeah. Right, right, right. That was a close call. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. I hate it that you assume all of us have read our Odyssey. <laughs> some of, some of us. It's been a while. Some of been a while. Names I will not mention were reading Victoria Holt novels instead of, <laughs> <laughs> instead of the Odyssey. Perfectly no, fine. No, Perfectly fine. It served no, you no, well. No, no. no I, when I when I set out to structure it as the Odyssey. I knew it was probably going to go over the head of most readers, you know, because you're right. How many people remember if they ever, in fact, read the Odyssey? You remember the Odyssey. Obviously, four, out, was of important to me. four out of five of, of us read it. And then there's. <laughs> <laughs> and and look, look, look what a failure you've been as a result, Mary Kay. I mean, it's yeah. doomed your writing life. It really it's has. It's too late, Sad. Mary Kay. Thank you. It's still out there. I'll Let get all the dustbins of history. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's your hero's journey. All right. Um, let's move from the live viewership. I think uh, Mary Kay, you have. Yeah. Uh, and um, Christy. Wait, um, Chris, is it whose turn is it? I'm losing track. I know whoever wants to grab. Do you want me to go? Okay. Page. Christy, why don't um, you? Barbara Bird says a common theme of the ordinary grace in this tender land is redemption and forgiveness and how nature plays a role in this. Can you elaborate on this theme? Well, it's interesting that uh, that the comment is, is that nature plays a role in this because um, I'm just, uh, as, as the comment comes in going, well, you're right. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. A tornado. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the... Uh, I, I just have to tell you that uh, one of the ways in which I have been able to survive um, the coronavirus is by being outside as much as I can. Um, I, uh, in the days when it was nice enough here in St. Paul to bike, I was out on my bike every day. Um, now I'm out on my cross country skis as much as I can or out hiking or walking because there's something about nature that is solace for the soul, you know, it is so comforting to be out there in nature. And so as the kids are going through um, their epic journey, there are so many moments when Odie notices the beauty of the natural world around him and it gives him hope. I'm thinking, for example, about the, the moment that he shares with Emmy when they see the, the field of fireflies. I was oh, thinking yeah. that same thing. Yeah. That, was such a, that was such a memorable snapshot. Well, I have to tell you, Mary Kay, I, I was taking it from real life. My wife is from Omaha, and uh, we have always gone down many times. And I remember one year, many, many years ago, uh, ap we headed down after work, so it was dark. And as we uh, came up to the crest of a hill in Iowa, the Iowa farm country, and started to descend the field, the valley on the other side was nothing but fireflies. As oh, far as we could see, uh, it was like the universe had come down to earth. And, and so I had to put that in the book. Yes, that was that a gift. That is magical. Mm -hmm. wow. okay. All right, Mary Kay. Yeah, um, D. Walsh uh, wants to know what you are writing right this minute, Kent. What are you writing? I'm working on number what will be number 19 in my Cork O'Connor mystery series. I haven't got a title for it yet. So if you guys want to suggest a title to me, I am more than okay. willing to listen. Just ask Kristen. She's our title yeah. go to. She's <laughs> our title guru. We'll, we'll, we'll get on the phone afterwards. You tell right. me what it's about. I'll have a title for you in five minutes. You know, <laughs> our readers, maybe our viewers can suggest a title for you, Ken. Mm -hmm. Well, my titles for my Cork O'Connor series are always two word place names that have a significant um, play a significant part in the story. Haven't quite found the one yet, but it'll come to me. It'll come to me. <laughs> well, we'll follow you and we'll wait for it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, now we get to the part where we really enjoy. This is the writing tip. And a lot of our viewers are writers as well. So we'd love to hear what you, a bit of advice you'd like to offer all of us. Sure. Um, here's my piece of advice. Uh, and it's going to take a bit, but there's a story, I think okay. a really good story associated with it. 
So um, I think as writers, we need to think of ourselves as artists and words are our medium. And I don't care uh, if you're an artist, I don't care what your medium is. I think if you're going to accomplish anything, you have to approach it in a disciplined way. So I'm a very disciplined writer for um, many, many, many decades now. My alarm clock has gone off at uh, a quarter of six every morning, seven days a week. I've gotten myself up and dressed. And before the coronavirus, I would go to a coffee shop where I would spend the first um, hours of the day writing. Um, now, there, when I began that process, there was a very practical reason for it. My wife had just entered law school, and I became the sole support of the family. I was the guy who had to keep a roof over her head and food on the table, but I wanted desperately to develop as a writer. So I had to come up with a way to meet my responsibilities as a family man and also a wrote. Um, we were living at that point uh, uh, just a couple of blocks from an iconic cafe in St. Paul, the St. Clair Broiler that opened its doors at six o'clock every morning, seven days a week. So I, I pitched this idea to my wife. I said, honey, if you're willing to get the kids up and dressed and fed and off to school first thing so that I can go right, I swear to you, when I come home from work at the end of the day, I will be the best husband, the best uh -huh. father you can possibly imagine. She bought it. So there I was. <laughs> there she I was. bought it. Oh, <laughs> <my> <laughs> So there I was at the boiler uh, at six o'clock every morning with my pen and my notebook in hand because this was uh, this was long before we even imagined laptop computers. Um, they would seat me in booth number four, always booth number four. They saved it for me. They There's your book title. Me. What was that? There's your book title. Booth four. <laughs> number four. A different book. Different book. <laughs> Uh, I would open my notebook and pick up my pen, and I would uh, from uh, from six fifteen until seven o'clock. I would write. Um, from 6 until 7.15, I would write, close my notebook, pay for the coffee, go out front where at uh, 7.20, a bus picked me up and took me to the university where I was working. Day in and day out, I did that, which helped me establish the discipline that I think is so necessary to being a writer. But you know, when I looked back finally on all of those years, I realized that it had done something even more important for me. What I realized when I looked back was that if I wrote first thing in the morning, I was feeding something in me that needed to be fed. Wow. And gave me the energy to go out into the world and give what you know whatever I had to give to it to keep a roof over head and food on the table because I'd taken a care of this very elemental part mm -hmm. of my being. What I realized is writing had become the way I center myself in every day and create the energy to go out and meet the world. And that's still one of the greatest blessings that I take away from my writing. So to any writers out there, my my best piece of advice is bend to the work every single day. Every day. You know, we all we all discovered that the five of us discovered that during uh, the pandemic and lockdown, we started doing these seven a.m. writing sprints. Kent, and oh. I, I was never very um, disciplined about my writing times. I was all over the map, and honestly, I think that that discovery came really late in my career. But it 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 is, I think, so helpful. It you changes. Know, it, it it helps you stay connected to the energy of the piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and the mornings are so, are much quieter, unless you yes. have a two-year-old running around. And <laughs> they're the time where you're, yeah, a four-year-old or a 22-year-old. <laughs> I need to be pretty quiet with a 22-year-old. He's still asleep, right? He <laughs> <laughs> gets up in about a half an hour. But, but there's, this, there's this sense in the mornings of this in-between time that really... Yes allows i think to dive into the piece in a different way so i love that right yeah tip. it's like stolen to, moments that you can take I have, yeah. I have to admit i borrowed it from uh, ernest hemingway uh, who was ah. one of my very early influences oh. Hemingway anyway, was that he loved nothing better than to rise at first light and spend two hours writing he thought it was the most creative time of the day and mm -hmm. at least for me i have to say i agree yeah yeah <laughs> So can our readers are um, love to ask what our guest authors are reading. So do you have a book that you can share that you'd love to recommend with everybody? Um, the, uh, the, do you know what I'm reading these days? And I'm guessing you're in the same boat. Almost entirely are ARCs or bound galleries. Yes. Yes. Other writers works. 
that I have been asked to read uh, with an eye to offering a dust jacket quote, a blurb. So if I told you about what I was reading now, you months and months, or who knows, yeah. before you see it. Uh, yeah. But I will tell you the, the the novel that I last read that really knocked my socks off um, was a novel by Lisa Wingate called um, Before We Were Yours, yeah. which uh, for me was a kind of a kindred story because like this Tenderland is set during the Great Depression and it's about the resilience of children struggling against in, enormous. Yeah. Yeah, she's a, she's a friend of ours here on the show, so it's good to hear that you like that. Yeah, it's such a good book. Um, we have a few announcements, so everyone out there, make sure to stay with us. You will not want to miss uh, miss our one final question for William Kent Kruger. Um, but before we dive into those quickly, I just want to tell you the book I just finished. It's Christie's Under the Southern Sky. <gasps> Which was oh, so, so good. good. Oh my gosh. It's by Christy Woodson Harvey. It comes out in Thank April. Um, I, I said it in the newsletter this week. Um, I, I've always loved Christy as a writer, but this is Christy at the top of her game. This is this is Thank a step you. up. It's beautiful. It's um I, I cried buckets. I it's it's just so good. But um you, we'll Thanks. be plenty talking plenty more about it, but I couldn't let tonight pass without oh, mentioning that. Oh, that's it's wonderful. <laughs> Thank no, you. I'm gonna cry a little. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't have any, I don't have any patience it. left to loan you. Sorry. <laughs> I hope you all can hear me. I'm sorry. I disappeared. I lost power in the house. Oh so, no! Oh no! Oh, yeah, no. Kev, do you have any um, recommendations of what what are you reading lately? Oh, we um, we, we have done that. <laughs> yeah, and, and so now Mary, Mary Kay is just about to tell us about this week's indie bookstore. All right. Yeah, um, and I love telling you about this week's indie bookstore, which is Once Upon a Crime in um, Minneapolis, right, Kat? Yeah. yeah. Yes, it is. Um, and that they are offering 10% off of all of Kent's novels and the recent titles of The, the Rest of Us, the F and F hosts. The link can be found on our Friends in Fiction Facebook page. And I, I'll tell you, it was a long time ago, but I've actually done a signing at uh, Once Upon a Crime. Oh, hey. ah. you know, when I was back when I was um, writing um, category mysteries. Yeah, it's a great it's it's a great town and and a great bookstore. So yeah. maybe when things get back to normal, Kent, we'll meet up and at the Roaster. Is that the name of the place? At the uh, the St. Clair Broiler. The St. Clair Broiler. Broiler. I would love that. Broiler. 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 <laughs> they have closed the doors. Oh, that's um, sad. I've had to find a new place to write. Oh, hate that. that's a shame. Christy, can you tell us a little bit about next week's show? Yes. So I'm hosting next week. I cannot wait. Um, it's a Just Us episode where we're going to celebrate our debut novels. Um, and also, we're going to introduce to you three debut novelists, Sarah Penner, Nancy Johnson, and Pamela Terry. And in keeping with the theme, on January 24th, on our Sunday bonus episode, we're hosting two fabulous debut authors, Susan Zorinda, who's the author of Bells for Eli, and Allison Hammer, the author of You and Me and Us. So it's going to be so a great week to talk about debuts. Yeah, so Susan's a good friend of the group, too. So this yeah. is exciting. Yeah, it's going to be great. And we also wanted to say thanks again to our sponsor, Mama Geraldine's. So remember to use the code FAB5 at mamageraldine's.com to get 20% off all online orders. And as Christy said, the shipping issue from last week is all resolved. The shipping is a great rate. Um, so go and get your cheese straws. They are delicious. Head on over, stock up. And as they say, snack on, y'all. And I'm, I'm, I'm a Northern transplant. Y'all does not come back to me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank on, you. Y'all. Kent, could you Snack on y'all. I now? got it. <laughs> well, Kent, now we get to ask you the final question. And in your bio, it reveals you had an eclectic approach to learning, lifelong learning, which I love. So I'm especially curious tonight to hear your answer to a question that we ask most of our guests. What were your family's values around reading and writing growing up? And how do you think that shaped you as the writer you are today? Great question. But before I answer it, I want to say this. I just want to thank you for all of the good work that you're doing for the for the writing community. Uh, all oh, of us. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. And thank, thank you, you for all the help you're giving to the independent booksellers these days. Because as much as uh, we all want them to still be there when we come out of this pandemic. 
So thank you for that. Oh, so you. if you were to ask me, uh, Mary Alice, why I am a writer, I would say it's because of my parents. Oh, uh, wow. Uh, that's I, what a tribute. I'd be a Freudian and a dream, though, because I blame everything on my parents. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a kid, I had parents who, I hope like your parents, read to you. As a child, I never went to bed at night. I never went down for a nap without a story being read to me. So I grew up thinking of the world in terms of stories. And for whatever reason, I always wanted to be one of the storytellers. That's awesome. I love that. That's beautiful. And your father, you said, was an English teacher? Indeed he was. Well, that explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Going into the classics. <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, thank you. It was such a treat. I knew you were going to be genuine and beguiling, and indeed you were. And we all had such a wonderful time. Thank you for being our guest tonight, Kent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's do it again thank soon. You. Yeah. Yes. yes. Let's do it. In real face, face to face. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yes. yes. And bring Cork O'Connor. <laughs> oh, they took Oh, no, he went oh. so weird. <laughs> hey, that's <laughs> so prickly. Let me just say, I highly recommend you all to read This Tender Land. And if you want to get a signed copy or personalized, contact Once Upon a Crime. And if you enjoyed our program, please join Friends in Fiction on our Facebook page or our website and give our podcast a listen now with original new interviews. And don't forget we're on Instagram too. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. See you next week. Till then, happy reading. Happy reading, everybody. And you guys, what a great episode. That was awesome. Oh. Oh.